So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tommy Andriola. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer here at the University of California system. Uh, that means I get to play with a lot of different technology in, in terms of how we're using it across the university, be it in the educational space, the, the research space, and, and even the healthcare space. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about really uh, three, uh, you know, three legs of a, of, a, of a stool in terms of talking about publicly available data, how we look at that, uh, research generated data, uh, public sector data, and the partnership between public and private. And so, so I'm going to start with talking with uh, publicly available data. Uh, that, you know, publicly available data, you know, and there was a great comment uh, from our keynote speaker about, you know, what exactly is publicly available data? I like to talk, ask the question, what is open data versus accessible data? Because, you know, there's a lot of data that's floating around that we have access to. If you talk about what we traditionally think is public data, one of the challenges that you see, and, and, and I've been talking to a lot more people outside of the university, uh, to cities, to states, and I really applaud those organizations that have moved forward and have hired chief digital officers or chief data officers to get called different things. But it's really about we have a lot of data floating around. More and more Internet of Things devices are being deployed that's you know, exponentially increasing the amount of data. But it traditionally has been trapped in silos. Uh, it's traditionally not been put in formats that we can get access to electronically or digitally to be able to leverage. And we have a lot of catching up to do, but at the same time, the future is going to exponentially grow that on us. And I think it really takes, uh, you know, organizations putting forward people like chief digital officers. I had a chance to sit down with the chief digital officer of New York State and talk to her about, you know, kind of her role, how she thought about really working with the agencies about making data available and putting it in formats that are more easily accessible and consumable but also connecting it to the constituencies of the state, whether those be individual citizens or not-for-profit organizations or for-profit companies in terms of she became that intermediary between there's a lot of value captured in that data, but it's siloed, it's not usable in, in its raw format, but what were people really looking for in the intermediary between the two? And I think that is something that we're going to see more of. I don't think it's going to be a state is issue. I think it's going to start to filter its way down. Uh, I was, as was just mentioned, in terms of cities are going to start thinking that way. Digital services are going to drive perception of whether my tax dollars are going to be more, um, whether my tax dollars are being spent in the right way. It's going to be shaped by what I experience digitally, and that gets to what data I, I get to see. Um, I think uh, I have a colleague over at the World Bank uh, who I sit down with uh, periodically by the name of uh, 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 Michael Vane. You know, and he talks about this concept of data informs policy. And I think that's really interesting and, and something that I've become a big advocate of is in terms of a lot of policy gets generated by a very small slice of data uh, spun in a particular way and then presented around, you know, uh, an agenda. And I think we're moving to a world and I think we want our citizens to really be activists in terms of let's look at lots of data. Let's aggregate large amounts of data and let data, which he, call, he just calls delivery, right, which are the experiments that they do and what they fund at the World Bank. But I think if you, if you unleash the data, data will actually inform what kind of policies that we need in place to drive society where, where we need it to go next or to drive the city in terms of what's its next wave of development. When we come here to the university and we think about, you know, uh, research-oriented data, we at the University of California with 10 campuses, uh, you know, we do about $4 billion a year from the, the federal public agencies in terms of research dollars. We also have a very healthy portfolio at our campuses in terms of private and, and, and philanthropic donations. But, you know, we, we recently had a forum where we took about the top 100 researchers from many different fields, brought them together, and we talked about what's the future of research and discovery. And it really was a discussion about data. It was a discussion about the, the, the boundaries of discovery are going to be pushed by researchers who are really looking at how do I take data? How do I collect data? What are the new f sources I have to, to actually start generating data, collecting it, aggregating it, analyzing it, and visualizing it? And so we talked about that, and it was really interesting that whether you talk to the astronomers, the physicists, the life sciences people, the, ag the agriculture and environmentalists, the digital humanities, those common themes fell out in terms of this was really about research is driven by data. 
And so we, in terms of our IT community, have really started talking about how do we uh, enable you know, that research community to, push, to continue to push the envelopes of research. At the same time, we see our, especially our funding, our federal funding sources, them saying all the data that you collect, not just your end, re end results, but all of your raw data, your interim analysis, that needs to be shareable. You need to demonstrate to us that you have strategies, that you have ways in terms of that the next researcher on genomics can take advantage of something that was done at your university. As I talk to some of our leading researchers and we talk to, to NSF in terms of what does the future look like, they feel like they're funding a lot of the creation of data sets today uh, for our research. And in the questions that they're asking us to respond to and hit the checks box, a few years down the road, what we're really looking at is we're not going to let you spend 20 percent of the grant money on building a data set because those data sets have already been funded in what we've been doing for the last five years. So now the data is there. We expect that you've made the investment and built the infrastructures to be able to leverage whether it's your own data set from the last grant we gave you or something that was done at the University of Michigan or MIT. You should be leveraging uh, publicly accessible data for your next level of research. Uh, in terms of private, uh, you know, private sector data, you know, I spent many years in the private sector, uh, both as an IT executive and a, and a business executive running and building IT businesses. You know, the private sector does look at data differently. They look at it as an asset. Uh, they look at it as competitive advantage. But I've seen a progression, and especially now coming over to the university side, is that the evolution of we need to hold on to our data, our data gives us insights into our customers or it's a monetization opportunity and a growth opportunity for us. Some of the leading organizations are moving beyond that. And they're starting to recognize the reality of that, you know, data generation, curation, even in a private enterprise, is one of the fastest growing cost elements of what's driving their, uh, the cost of running their business. And they're starting to say, we can't afford to do this all ourselves. So we are, you know, we are working together now. Uh, and we need to work together with others. And so we actually have one of our campuses as part of a, a growing consortium in an area called smart manufacturing, where a couple of hundred manufacturers in many, many different uh, areas of our economy are coming together and basically saying, we want a platform to be able to share our data and really look at uh, the insights associated with a very, very large data set. So we're looking at this data. It needs to be separate and, you know, um, you know, General Motors and Ford data needs to be kept separate and anonymized to a certain level, but we want that data in the pool, in the platform, that we can then start to analyze because we need to drive, you know, the next level of manufacturing evolution, and that manufacturing evolution is important to the nation's economy. So we're starting to see that some of the data consumers are really looking at it, there's a competitive aspect of data, but there's also a commodity aspect of data, and the private sector wanting to work with, let's say, universities who can be objective arbitrators of data platforms working together in order to say we can move this all forward because it makes sense for us to work together to share the costs, but also share the risks associated, uh, you know, with, with, with data collection and curation. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, you know, the, and it's really the three stools support the, the, the stool, and there's something on top of the tool that it's very, very near and dear to my heart, which is data to me is a catalyst of innovation in today's world. It's a catalyst for our researchers here at the university because they need the data to drive whatever the next set of questions that, that they're looking at. It's, it's what the private sector is looking at to drive innovation to move their companies forward, whether that to be on a competitive level or in their globalization strategies. And so we really need to look at data as a catalyst of innovation towards really keeping our economy vibrant. And I think that's a concept that you were going it, to, it, it's relatively new. A lot of it before, especially with the private sector, was about, you know, business processes and insights into customers customer intimacy, but now that is all really being driven by, let's look into the data. Let's have data-driven decisions and competitive advantage will, will come through that. And so I do a lot of work with healthcare. Uh, and uh, just to show you the types of questions we're asking ourselves here, because we're both a research institute in healthcare, but also a healthcare provider through our academic medical centers, hospitals, and clinics, touching 13 and a half million patients in the state of California. So roughly 40% of, of the population of the state. 
And so we're talking about concepts about publicly available data, data that sits within our enterprise, whether it be you know, patient health records now electronically kept, research insights that are done, let's say in the area of breast cancer, social media data that are really in the form of apps that we're getting our patients to use as part of their management of their disease state, whether it be a chronic disease state or, or recovering from, uh, from cancer and keeping it in remission. We're starting to look at these very diverse data sets and say, how do we drive the future of healthcare? How do we inform healthcare decisions, both for the provider, the doctor, and for the patient? And we're talking about sizes of a trillion data points because we're thinking about not just what happens in our hospitals or clinics. We're thinking about the, the, the large pools of data that, that are kept by the CDC or NIH, right? or the insurance companies who have incredible claims data. As I was talking to one earlier this week, 80 million patient records. But that's claims information. You combine that with a detailed patient record to say that this is not only the drug that the, that the patient was given, but here are the effects of that drug over the three-month period that he or she took that drug. You can start combining this data. You're starting asking yourself different questions. And now we're talking about concepts like personalized or precision medicine which President Obama has made a commitment to in, in this year's State of the Union address. So I think what we're seeing is that you know, data is now front and center for both public and private entities, that they're willing to work together in ways that they haven't necessarily uh, done or they've stayed separate. I think being at a research university has is, is put us right at the intersection of a lot of very, very interesting conversations and evolving models for how organizations as a whole work together. So thank you.